Hi, I'm Stephen with AlbertaUrbanGarden.ca. Today is episode two of three in this year's Home Garden Field Trial Results videos. Today, I'm going to take a look at the soil results and put the main claim of both rock dust and charged biochar to the test, that they both add nutrients to the soil. The trials were set up so that the only difference between the three beds was the application of rock dust to this bed and the application of charged biochar to the top bed, with no product being added to this bed, the control. This lets us establish that any differences between the beds, especially when in comparison to the control, are attributed to the products themselves and nothing else. If you would like a more detailed description of how we set up the trials, I highly recommend watching part one of the 2015 results, as it gives more context to the results I'll be presenting today. Prior to moving on to the soil results today, I would like to address a clarification. A number of you had asked if I had charged the biochar prior to applying it to the garden. Yes, I did charge the biochar with a biologically activated compost, and it was allowed to sit for four weeks prior to planting. A homogeneous mixture of the same volume of activated compost was applied to the control and rock dust bed. This allowed all three beds to start with the same nutrients and bacterial colonies. Without further ado, let's move on to today's soil results. First, let's take a look at the soil's pH. Soil pH is very important as it regulates nutrient availability in soils. Last year's results found the pH concentrations between each of the beds in the optimal range for vegetable gardens. Because pH is a logarithmic scale, the experts that I consulted during the preparation of this video consider a difference of more than 0.2 to be statistically different results. The control bed's pH dropped 0.42 over the season, indicating the soil became more acidic. This spring and fall's results varied less than 0.2 in the charged biochar and rock dust beds, resulting in them being considered stable. With that in mind, all of the results fell within the optimal range for vegetable garden plant growth of 5.5 to 6.5, meaning the pH results in this year's trial likely did not have a significant effect on the nutrient availability of the soil. Before we move on to the organic or macronutrients, let's take a look at the essential and beneficial trace elements in the soil. The results provided by Maxim Analytics represent the total available and unavailable elements in each bed. In order to analyze, I used a real percent difference analysis with a very conservative value of 100. If the RPD number is over 100, then the two numbers you are comparing are statistically different. The reason why we're analyzing the trace elements in the soil is because it speaks to the main product claim of both of these products. Namely, that they result in higher nutrient concentrations within the soil. Trace elements are used in such low concentrations that over the course of the season we should not see a decrease in concentrations. Rather, both the rock dust and biochar beds should overall have more nutrients than the control if the claim holds up. Soil tests were taken from the same location in each bed and were a mixture of soil from the surface all the way down to where the underlying parent material is. The samples were located immediately adjacent to the 2014 sample location. For ease of today's results, we'll only be speaking about the elements that have been either proven or highly suggested to be essential for plant growth or beneficial. When comparing the spring results to the fall results, there were no noted differences within the individual trial beds. The takeaway from this is that there was no change within a single season of the micronutrients that are essential and beneficial for plant growth within the individual beds. When comparing the charged biochar pre and post season to the control, there was no noted difference within boron, calcium, iron, magnesium, manganese, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, sulfur, cobalt, copper, molybdenum, nickel, selenium, and zinc. Meaning that there was no statistical difference between the charged biochar bed here and the control bed. The pre-season rock dust results had statistically the same amount of the following elements when compared to the pre-season control results. Boron, calcium, iron, magnesium, manganese, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, sulfur, cobalt, molybdenum, nickel, and selenium. The preseason rock dust results had lower concentrations of a number of elements. However, of these, only zinc and copper are considered essential for plant growth. This is really interesting, as when I compared the post-season results for the rock dust to the control, 
all of the RPDs then fell below 100, meaning these two beds were statistically similar in this, at the end of the season. This is really interesting. As I mentioned earlier, the maximum results represent both the plant available and unavailable concentrations of these elements. As there was no external input of soil or nutrients into these beds throughout the growing season, with the exception of the soil that came in on the tomato and pepper seedlings, in order to avoid any skewing of the data due to that source, the sample locations were carefully selected to avoid those lo locations where we had planted those plants in the spring. When I looked further into these results, I noticed that the elements that dissolve in water did not show the same trend as the heavy metals that do not dissolve. Elements that can be transported by water are called soluble salts, and because of this, they are generally more evenly distributed throughout soil. Heavy metals, however, are not soluble and are often found in hot spots within the soil. This year's results may be explained by this phenomenon. Even though these beds, when initially set up, were mixed extremely well, the heavy metals would have settled in hot spots. And if you did not transect one during the sampling, you may have results that show lower concentrations when compared to a control. I'm going to park the trace element results for a moment and speak about the macronutrients or the organic nutrients that the plants require in much higher concentrations. Plants do require things like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur in much higher concentrations throughout the growing season. As such, we would expect these results to show lower concentrations of these elements at the end of the season when compared to the beginning, and that the, if these two products hold up, we should see higher concentrations of those macronutrients within the trial beds when compared to the control. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur did show drops in concentrations throughout the growing season as their RPD numbers were well over 100. When we compare the preseason rock dust and charged biochar beds to the control, there is no statistical difference in the organic nutrient content with the exception of slightly more nitrate in the control bed when compared to the rock dust bed. This trend then reverses in the post-season when the rock dust bed has slightly more nitrate than the control. This can be easily explained by the relatively transitory nature of nitrogen in the soil. The reason why we've spent so much time analyzing the nutrients in the soil is because this is the main and core claim of both of these products. Namely, that rock dust adds nutrients through a variety of minerals, while biochar is able to act as a sponge and hold more nutrients in place, preventing leaching. These products are sold and marketed to gardeners like myself, whom take great care in their garden soil. So the results only represent rich soil conditions a poor soil trial may yield slightly different results. To investigate this further, last year I had two of the main horticultural grade rock dust products tested and the raw biochar that was used in this trial. The intent of having the products tested is to see what they are adding to the soil. At face value, this year's trial results are very confusing. For instance, rock dust has a high concentration of calcium, however, the control bed has statistically the same concentration of calcium as the amended rock dust bed. It makes a lot more sense when you think of how these products are recommended to be applied in your garden. As a part of these trials, we applied rock dust at a much higher rate than what was recommended by the advocates and producers. A large application rate was chosen in order to ensure that if this product had an effect, we would clearly see it. The application rate ended up being one pound or 453 grams of rock dust per square foot or square 30 centimeters. In one square foot, 12 inches deep of garden soil, the bed has a cubic volume of 1,728 inches or 28,317 cubic centimeters of soil. To this, we're adding 28 cubic inches or 400 and 58 cubic centimeters of rock dust to the 1728 cubic inches and that represents 1.6 percent of the total volume when mixed in. The charged biochar was applied at 0.5 pounds or 226 grams per square foot. It did come with just a little bit of trace elements but for the most part it was negligible. That said, biochar's main claim is not that it actually adds the nutrients, is that it acts as a sponge and holds nutrients, preventing them from leaching. In part one of this year's three-part results video for the home garden field trials, we saw the control bed producing the highest volume of crops, followed by a slightly lower charged biochar bed and a significantly lower rock dust bed. Today's results do not explain why there was such variance in the harvests of each bed, however, do cast some doubt on the central claim of these products 
as amendments for home gardens. It would appear that even at the much higher than recommended application rate, rock dust fails to live up to its central product claim of adding more nutrients to the soil. And this is simply a fact of the application technique itself. It does not result in high enough concentrations being added for it to be statistically relevant at all. In order for the rock dust to have a significant impact on the nutrients, even at this much higher application rate, it would have to have several orders of magnitude more nutrients contained within the product itself. This, for a product that cost me $80 to apply to just this bed, the charged biochar also fall short of its main product claim that it is able to prevent leaching within garden soil. As my garden soil already prevents leaching to such a high degree of efficiency that adding the biochar simply does nothing. Our results may be explained today by the good garden soil itself. Good garden soil usually contains something called humus, which acts very similar in retaining nutrients in the soil. While today's results do not support the main product claim of rock dust and charged biochar, that it increases the nutrients within the soil itself, on the third installment of this year's home garden field trial results, we're going to take a look at more plant tissue to address the second most prominent claim made about these products, that produce grown within them will we'll take up more nutrients, hence being more nutrient dense. If you've missed any of the home garden field trial videos, click on the playlist on screen now. Thank you very much for joining me today. I appreciate it very much, and I hope you have a fantastic day.